Who is Jesus? What is he doing? And what does it mean to follow him in the world today? My name is Matt Lewis. This is the Follower Podcast, and everyone is invited to the conversation. Hello and welcome to episode three in the series of Mountains Bow Down. Today we're going to be talking about uh, the Mountain of Light, which is about choosing conviction at the place of compromise. This story happens in a place called Birtamod, which was southeast in the nation of Nepal. We had been in Kathmandu for some time and then ended up driving about 12 hours, I think, uh, to the east of the nation. And so we arrived at our friend's homes there, actually in the middle of the night. Well, not in the middle of the night, it was like seven, eight at night, it was dark. And I remember as we arrived there, man, I was so tired. I'd been sitting in the back of a cramped uh, van and they greet us, beautiful, uh, smiling faces, very, very happy people, very warm people. And so get our bags in and we get into the house and of course they offer us some, some chia, the tea, Nepali tea. We have some chia, we connect, and then we go to bed and we rest. And I remember waking up the next morning and I hadn't really taken anything in the night before because we had just arrived and it was dark. I remember waking up the next morning and walking out of my room and up onto the balcony that looked over the area. And just been struck by how peaceful the space was. And it wasn't just because of the surroundings. It was almost like there was an atmosphere of peace that kind of hovered over the space. I would say it was the way I would describe it it as a little outpost of heaven there in Nepal. Uh, There seemed to be a presence uh, and otherness about that space. And so we got to know our friends a little bit better. And then they told us that we would be going into town, into Birtmont town that evening uh, because it was Christmas, right? And so we ended up going with them to this Christmas event that they held in Nepal. Now, again, to give you context, Nepal in a lot of ways is a closed nation. Uh, There's anti-conversion laws. So this is not the kind of place where you can uh, openly just talk about Jesus. And yet uh, our friends there set up this, this, this Christmas event really in one of the busiest areas of of Bertamo, their area. And, and what it looks like is them with the guitar singing Christmas carols on a loudspeaker. Um, and then as they're gathering this crowd, and this crowd does start to gather, quite a large crowd, um, singing Christmas carols and then telling the Christmas story in public. Now, of course, they're not doing anything illegal necessarily. They're not trying to force anyone to follow Jesus, but they are just being very vocal about their faith uh, in a country where there is risk involved in doing that. And I remember sitting in that moment, I think I was, yeah, I was down on the side and then our our team ended up singing a Christmas carol as well in that space. And I remember being so uncomfortable with this whole uh, experience because for me, coming from my context, we just don't do stuff like that. I mean, imagine if you went to the busiest mall you could possibly find, set up a loudspeaker that was there was a bit, you know, like broken and, and um, not the best quality sound. And then just started singing at the top of your voice, Christmas carols. And then as people gathered, just uh, really telling them the Jesus story. And I mean, we've heard lots of stories about evangelists and people who stand on soapboxes and all these kinds of things. And I think a lot of us, maybe even for some of the right reasons, are a little bit reserved when it comes to that. But I remember thinking to myself, this is, this is so out of my comfort zone, right? And then something beautiful starts to happen. In the midst of this very uncomfortable experience, a line starts to form and people are given candles. So they light these candles, right? And we start walking single file with these candles in a procession to the busiest traffic circle in that part of the town. And there's cars going by and it's Nepal, so it's okay. We just walk in the traffic and we're kind of walking through these cars. And what ends up happening is people put their candles on this traffic circle until the whole traffic circle is covered by candles and a light. Uh, not on fire, just lit up by all these candles. And I remember looking around in that moment and something shifted in me from a place of being really, really uncomfortable to a place of being amazed, actually. I looked around and I saw people driving in their cars and we were just saying Merry Christmas to these people and they were saying Merry Christmas back to us. And the tone of the environment was not hostile. People were 
celebrating this outward expression of faith in Jesus in a nation where it's not really legal to even do that. And for the first time in that moment, I thought to myself, man, what does conviction look like? What does conviction look like? And is it possible that our civilized uh, Western world perspective has in some ways made us shy away from conviction and maybe pushed too far into the world of compromise and maybe in the process have we maybe lost the potency of our witness for the unique and essential nature of the story of Jesus. Now when I talk about compromise let me say I understand that there's healthy compromise and unhealthy compromise. In fact, so much of my own conviction is that the truth exists in the tension. That if we end up polarizing things and drawing sort of false divides between this or that, instead of entering, entering into what Ellis Potter calls the 200% reality of this and that, uh, sometimes we can unnecessarily separate people. So I understand healthy compromise. I'm for it. And for us sitting around a table and meeting one another where we are, and then also recognizing that none of us own Jesus, uh, as Leslie Newbegin would say, we're all just we're pointing our pointing people toward Jesus. I get it. So my version of Jesus is not the Jesus. My perspective on Christianity is not the total truth. And yet, at the same time, there is such a thing as truth. His name is Jesus, and he's alive. And so, how I guess do we enter into the tension? of drawing a line between losing the potency of faith by, by adding Jesus to the free market of religions and allowing him to become one of just a number of many others. Where we kind of throw up our hands and say, oh, there's, there's many roads that lead to the same truth. And we believe that false idea that actually all beliefs are the same. All religions are, are superficially different, but fundamentally the same. But in reality, the exact opposite is true. They are superficially the same, but fundamentally different. Have we maybe forgot the words of C.S. Lewis where he says, you know, Jesus is either liar, lunatic, or Lord. And if he is Lord, then he is essential, unique, important. And are we convicted about that in a world that's trying to turn down that conviction? What does it mean for us to turn it up? What does it mean in a world that is so evidently suffering from broken ideologies and broken ways of seeing things to become people who, in the best possible way, draw some lines in the sand and say there are some things where we are anchoring ourselves in this truth and we won't move from this truth, even if it means we're persecuted for this truth. And in fact, blessed are us people who are persecuted for all the right reasons because in the same way they persecuted the prophets and even our Jesus before us. What does it mean to be willing to count the discomfort of shifting away from a superficial kind of compromise that really waters down our conviction as to who Jesus really is? And in in your way, start singing some Christmas carols in the town square, lighting some candles and putting it right at the intersection of your cities and spaces where you live your life. I love the metaphor of that, right? We weren't putting candles in a church secluded from the city out to the side where we could kind of build our own little closed enclave of thinking. No, no, no. We went into the public square. We went to, the, to that intersection where the whole town meets. We, we entered into the market of ideas and in that place made a declaration that Jesus is who he says he is. I think about this idea that at the moment in our world, there's a, there's a danger of two kinds of things starting to happen. We can either become assimilated into the culture where what we do is we turn down all of our beliefs in order to find a table, uh, to find a seat at the table. And so we don't want to be too offensive with what we believe. We don't want to be too strong on what we believe. And so if other people say that G- this Jesus is not that important, well, maybe we'll kind of accept that so that we don't get kicked out of the room. But on the other side, we can get into the dangerous place of building our high walls and creating a tribe of people who think like like us, speak like us, these sort of self-affirming closed communities of same ideas. And then because our walls are so high, we just shut ourselves out from the world and anyone who would challenge our perspectives. And so then we're right within our small little version of the world. And I think both of these ideas 
are unhelpful. I think what we need to do is choose the cruciform way, uh, that way that's right in the middle that says, no, no, we're neither left nor right. We're neither this nor that. We're Christians. We're followers of Jesus. And when we look like Jesus, when we stand in the middle, the truth is we're probably going to offend both sides. We may get stones thrown at us from both directions, but at least we'll be standing for something. Uh, I think about the words of Jesus in in Matthew chapter 5. Listen to these uh, words. This comes to us from the message. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. And if I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. And now that I've put you there on a hilltop on a light stand, shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. Be opening up to others. You'll prompt people to open up with God, their generous Father in heaven. And so I guess for me, what does it mean at a time like this to put our light on a lampstand? What does it mean to put it under a basket? And where in the name of compromise and the name of acceptance have we maybe toned down what needs to be turned up? so that we can be exactly what Jesus has called us to be. Now, I know what you're thinking, Uh, Matt, that's all very nice, but, you know, singing some songs uh, in in a public square and putting some candles on a traffic circle, that that stuff hardly changes the world. And I would agree with you, except that here's what's powerful. This was not an isolated event. In fact, the potency of this one moment was made stronger by the consistency of the lives of the people that we were living with, right? You see, because when that Christmas moment was done, we went back to their home. And for the next weeks in that place, we lived the gospel in a profound sense right in the public space. In front of everyone, we started to let our good works shine before men so that they could see them and then praise our Father in heaven. What do I mean by that? In the simplest things, there was one day where our friend asked us if we would spend the day just cleaning up the road. So taking the weeds out of the tar. And so we had this, these picks and we were taking all the weeds out of the tar and cleaning up the driveway in front of his house. And I remember asking him, why is this so important to you? And he looked at me and he said, Matt, this is a way that we actually preach the gospel. Yeah, actually in uh, Nepal, that most of the people, they have a concept that uh, uh, to build the road and to make the road and uh, to maintain the road is the responsibility of the government. But we are trying to show as a Christian to the people that uh, in front of their house, uh, most of the time their roads are broken and uh, it's, uh, everything is destroyed. And what we are trying to teach them as, a, as an example, if we fix the road just in front of our house by ourselves, then for the government is nothing to do. They make a very nice house, but just in front of the house, there is nothing. So we are just trying to give them the living example. Yeah. So just we are doing this. So for you, looking after these roads and cleaning up the neighborhood, even yes. with the papers and everything, for you this is like a gospel witness? Yes, actually, uh, even you see that in everywhere, there is a uh, people they throw the trash just in front of their house, plastics and bottles and plastic bottles and whatever rubbish, they just throw in front of their house. But in our how, uh, ch- uh, church and in our house, surrounding like a 500 meters area that we clean every day and we clean the thrasses and then we burn it down in one uh, place and if it is the things that we can make the fertilizer from it we just make the fertilizer and we clean the road everywhere so at least we hope that people they learn and another thing that they say that oh christian people they like the cleanliness so this is one of the gospel also right he 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 said The culture here is that everybody's waiting for the government to make their lives better. But we know that as followers of Jesus, we're actually called to be stewards of the earth. And so even in the smallest ways, what's important for us is that we steward the little patch of earth that God has given to us well. And you saw this in the way that they didn't waste anything. There was literally no wastage. No meal was wasted. They use everything. They reuse everything. You saw this in the way that they were growing their own food, looking after the environment, the way that they were fostering children who had been left homeless because of earthquakes in the nation, and even that they were bringing children into their home from the nation neighboring theirs. And none of this without cost. It was, it was difficult for them to do this, but they just so believed in being salt and light in their environment. 
And even more than that, when we, when we would have a meal, the house was like open house. And so neighbors would come and eat at their table, even if they didn't have enough for themselves. And in the culture, the, the, the man of the home, he would eat last, right? And so children would eat first, then guests, then all the women in the home, and then the man would eat last. And so there would be times, I would look at my friend who was looking after us, and his plate would almost have nothing on it. He'd have some rice and a little bit of sauce on top of that while everybody else had eaten the food that may have been for him. And I looked at this and I thought to myself, man, the potency of their lived life is what gives validity to moments of their loud declaration. And I wonder what that looks like for us to be people of real conviction about the things of Jesus. That's, that's what challenged me. And I thought to myself, you know, we live in a world where we need that kind of conviction. Right. Nobody's really moderate in the world at the moment, if we're honest. Moderation is kind of being turned down, but, but the extremism that's rising up in its place is like an extremism of exclusion and an extremism of tribalism and an extremism of populism and nationalism and these, all the isms right, and ideologies. There's so many uh, other worldviews that are getting lots of airtime that the volume is being turned up high on those things. And yet, for some reason, as Christians, we consistently think that our job is to turn down the volume on these things. Now, now what I'm not saying is that we need to be aggressive. And I'm not saying that we need to fight for our place at the table. I don't think it makes sense to try and speak about an ideology of a different spirit in the same spirit as those broken ideologies that we're trying to reform, I guess. But what I am saying is that I think we need to show up. And I think we need to realize that showing up may cost us. And it may cost us from lots of different sides. And increasingly, it may cost us. And so I guess where this really challenged me in my life is, uh, what am I convicted about? And what price am I willing to pay for those convictions? How am I willing to let my light shine? How am I willing to be a city on a hill? And, And not just for a moment, but for a lifetime. Now, that doesn't exclude the moment, but it calls me to a kind of substance in my way of being in the world that gives validity to messages like this on uh, your screen. That's, that's what challenges me. And I left there thinking to myself, man, I, th- I think Jesus, I've got a long way to go. And I'm so grateful that you brought me all the way to the other side of the world to view you through a different cultural lens so that I could see some of the weaknesses of my own cultural lens. Yeah. And so I guess maybe the question then is, what does that look like for you? Where might God be inviting you to show up? Is it in your family? Is it in your workplace? Is it in your church? Right? What are some of the things that God is asking you to address, to be convicted about? And to count the cost of resistance for. And what I'm not speaking about here necessarily is sort of being a social media activist, right? And clicking and reposting and thinking that that's enough. What I'm speaking about here is the kind of change that happens when people in the deepest parts of who they are decide to live in the world in a different way. And that's some of the hardest stuff to do. Particularly in South Africa, if you're listening to this... You know, we, we live in a nation of such deep brokenness. What does it mean for us as Christian people to decide to live in that nation in a different way? If you're in Europe at the moment, in America at the moment, uh, really all around the world, some of the places I travel to, you, you see the influences of a lot of ideas that are fighting for dominant attention. And those ideas are not helpful. And I guess the question that you and I have to ask is, uh, where will we draw the line? What are we really convicted about? Because our our lights depend on it in some ways. Uh, We need to allow our good works to shine before men so that people would see them and then praise our Father in heaven. And so God, I I pray that you would help us do that. And, And I hope this thought has been helpful for you. And I hope that as you think about the different places, I, I love that imagery again to close here of, of that traffic circle, that we weren't off to the side. So often we tend to do that, right? We can be passionate for Jesus when we're surrounded by people who look like us, think like us, agree with us. But what does it mean to move into the middle of the public space and there to have an opinion? 
and, and there to take a stand and there to be the kind of person who is a picture of another reality? That would be a great question to ask ourselves. Thanks so much. And we'll see you on the next episode of Mountains Bow Down.